Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm very happy to share together with all of you regarding my research on organizational resilience. So basically, I conducted some interviews with my Chinese collaborators uh, in Shanghai, and then we discussed about the organizational resilience issue due to the COVID-19 crisis. We can see we come up with three stage approach and uh, equipped by a hierarchical goal theory. And I will discuss the cases and the theory and our approach uh, through, the case, through the three cases. Okay. So we can see. Uh, today talk, I will first introduce about the COVID-19 and also what is the theory and what is organization resilience with the cases and then three stage and then follow up by a Q&A we collected from the chat board. Okay, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have Many countries, territories, and also people uh, are suffering because of that. And the most important thing is our economic um, and the well-being of people's here are damaged because of the COVID-19. And then we have the worldwide deep freeze of the economy. Uh, in our education sector, we already feel that. And then we can say it is a large scale halt in production a dramatic hit in global supply chains, a deep decrease in consumption and dramatic collapse in confidence as well. So it's very uh, important to see how the organizations can face um, this crisis and what are the strategies they can use. We can see that uh, UK government now is um, doing all they can to attract the talents globally, but at the same time need to deal with, especially small and medium-sized organizations to fight with the uh, decrease of the e economy. So we can see impact of the crisis on enterprises in hardest hit sectors. Uh, according to the colors, you can see some are high impact uh, according to the crisis, like the manufacturing, accommodation, food services, wholesale, real estate, etc. And then medium to high impact are those sectors like uh, ent entertainment, art and uh, recreation, others like uh, transportation, and where is education? Okay, construction is media, financial services, mining, uh, agriculture, uh, low, and then uh, education is low. But However, we, we don't know how much it will influence us in the coming, coming year, but it definitely influenced a great deal of it. So we can see it's a risk now because of the serious disruption and then nearly half of those in wholesale and retail trade are suffered. So today's uh, opportunity is very great. So I would like to use the uh, talk and then to solicit more uh, inspiring questions from our audience and then maybe we can discuss about what to do and how we can do to, e to increase organizational resilience and then we can share ideas about what are the best practices in the previous during the COVID-19 and post COVID-19 what we can do to deal with the crisis. And now we can look at the organizational resilience definition. It refers to the cap capability of an organization to absorb strain and preserve desirable functioning despite catastrophic events and rapidly recover or bounce back from untoward um, shocks. So it's very important that we say the organization supply chain is resilient, the marketing, functioning is resilient, etc. However, as organization, how to achieve resilience overall? We need to look at the resilience from a multiple stakeholder perspective using hierarchical goal theory, because as an organization, it is uh, an organization with multiple identities, which means that it is an economic entity itself, it is a corporate citizen, regarding to the society or to the country. Uh, it is a competitor to other companies in the market. Uh, it is an employer for all the employees. 
and then they have social responsibilities. At the same time, they are customer for the landlord. They need to fulfill the landlord um, requirements and then uh, service to uh, product suppliers for their customers. So if we look into all these uh, multiple identities, we need to take a role take a look of the hierarchical goal theory, which means that we incorporate all the multiple stakeholders into the picture. And we can see this is a hierarchical theory and organization resilience. And then you, this uh, Carrie in our management division, and then she put forward the conceptual goal hierarchy model. We are starting from the value. So the underlying value of the organization is very important. And then from the value, like what you want to achieve long term or short term, and whether you want to be sustainable, whether you want to be the number one in terms of technology, etc. So uh, it's very important and you can uh, look into the identity and then to, inf to look at the uh, personal projects and then look at the task objectives uh, accordingly. So what are the strategies that the organization want to have? It depends on what kind of value, what kind of priority they have on their list and how they achieve the strategy. So these are all connected. So if we use this hierarchical goal theory, it's better for us to understand what are the identity of the organization and what are the priority for them using this identity and what therefore would be the best task that they should be focusing on. And so the, the time is limited because of COVID-19. The window for you to take the strategy um, actions is quite uh, tight in terms of the timeline. So how you can grasp the opportunity and then to become resilient and to become a successful player in the market that will be very important. So we need to be very, very clear about the value, about the identity. So for the three cases, I have three cases. The first one is the English education company in China, in Shanghai. And you know that we all love to learn English. And then in China, the, uh, we call a tiger mummy, tiger parents they, who push their uh, kids to start English learning from year like five years old or four years old. So the English education company actually is focusing on educating the kids with the year of five or six years old. So we uh, know that previously is one to one or one to two, this uh, communication and class setting. However, due to COVID-19, students, uh, the young kids cannot go to the offline stores. They have to turn to online operation. Meanwhile, the parents want to get the uh, tuition fee funded, refunded by the organization. So the founder of the English education company is very worried. At the same time, the landlord want to get the rent accordingly. They, they also want to re continue to collect the rent. Uh, actually, they, they even don't use the classroom. So the founder cried for several days. And then um, she had a very long uh, conversation with the landlord for several times. And then to persuade him, saying that actually we are on the same boat. I uh, I, if I cannot give you the rent as we promised, you cannot find another um, company to rent your uh, your uh, classroom as well. So we are on the same boat. So how about reduce rent and then we can collaborate. Then please become one of the investors in our company. So the landlord decided to join their management board and then try to say that yes we can work together to get through this period of time so the company designed new products to acquire cash flow they retain former customers to decrease refund and then offer discount to them and the landlord become the collaborator and reduce the employees best salary to an appropriate extent so they closed um, off offline uh, and then all become the online video capturing and the online learning uh, format. 
actually they use the brainstorming with all the employees in the company and to decide what are the operation models that we can focus on. It's very interesting. It's called reverse brainstorming. It's not ordinary brainstorming we are using. It's called reversed brainstorming because we need to deeply think about the problems that we are facing. All the pre-assumptions previously we had should be off the table. It, we should to we should pay attention to the new environment, new challenges, everything changed. So it's reversed brainstorming. And then so we need to totally shift our model to develop online courses and then to promote online courses with short video and then promote online courses using existing customer networks. And we try to develop new market accordingly. So. It's very interesting that the first case, we find that they even develop new markets that serve customers in other areas based on online channels. For example, they can uh, target at uh, middle school students, uh, secondary students, uh, three school students, and then they can develop employee skills. Like today, what we are working on, and then Sarah is leading, we can develop a video recording and the producing skills for our employees and which is a very good bonus for the overall company to develop in the future. So just now the case was about um, treating the landlord as a co-investor and then to look at the identity of the company to the customers and then different customers. The second case is about a manufacturing company. And then the company is very interesting. It, it mentioned about uh, um, what our country needs in short and long terms. It's a case of a PC board production factory. Um, so because of COVID-19, the manufacturing workers cannot all come to the factory at the same time. So for example, they need to come, some of them uh, on Monday, some of them on Tuesday. It's a two shifts. And then the two shifts with their corresponding leaders and the managers and the employees, frontline employees, they cannot meet with each other among the two shifts. So between the two shifts, they are totally isolated. So in case one shift employees and the manager got sick, the other shift can still retain the quality and then to deliver the manufacturing tasks that are required by the market. So the overall uh, company faced a very difficult time due to COVID-19. And during the dinner table, a dinner time when the CEO discussed with your um, peer colleagues in other companies, he found out there's a kind of line, supply chain line or a production line, uh, which can be easily redesigned from their current uh, production line to a melt sparing cross. Uh, manufacturing line, which means that they can use their current capacity just to redesign a little bit, then they can transfer their current line to produce masks. Um, the manufacturing um, supplier for the masks. So it's very interesting. The CEO, after the just uh, at the dinner table, he immediately we chat. The, his CTO, uh, Chief Technology Officer, and ask whether it is possible because other companies, they try to do so, and our company is very similar. Can we do that? And then in two days, they provide a very good uh, estimation with only 120K Chinese ZMB, and then they can do this uh, very quickly, like uh, 12K uh, pounds. They can do this very quickly. So he inv increased the investment in this part and then rescheduled and redesigned the assembly line. And then, so they have the uh, melt spray cloth um, to deliver it on time to the market, which is a huge benefit, a huge revenue for the overall production. And then, but they, they know that there's risk in the very quick market because the masks uh, price were very high at one time period. And after the certain months, the price will uh, decline 
very quickly. So they ensure that they need to have guarantee of full payment in advance and cash on hand uh, to reduce risk. And then they never expand the assembly line, just one assembly line. And then so ensure that they can control the intention to be so greedy and then they can strictly control the sales collection. And at the same time, they are looking at the future investment in research on real transit industry to obtain long-term sales, which means that their manufacturing of the PC board is not very uh, promising in the future, but they look at the real industry in Chinese, uh, in China, we have a high speed rail industry. And then some of the, um, some of the board, they need to be changed and using the PC board. They can use the PC board, which is sustainable. It's not some glasses that's not sustainable. So, and very cheap. So they try to, they increase, um, they increase the uh, uh, R&D uh, with the, um, investment in research on real transit uh, industry that collaborate with materials uh, scientists to, to set up R&D teams. And then so they also win the bid from the, um, from the uh, country regarding the real industry overall change of the PC board. So they have very good opportunity. They already win the bid and then they can sustainably provide this kind of material and it's very environmentally friendly and it is making long-term benefit for the organization. So which means that they meet the great and urgent demand for melt spraying cloth in the short term, but for the long term, they meet with the demands from the country regarding the high-speed rail industry. So this is a very good uh, transformation for the second case. So let's look at uh, our third case. If we look at the third case, it is a kind of a food industry. Let's say um, it seems very easy. However, uh, it is not very easy if we look at our uh, current uh, business model. Why we call it easy? Because the it is a company we call it king of ball. It produces uh, the baozi. Baozi in Chinese, baozi is similar as our hamburger, Chinese style hamburger. So a king of baozi, they, they want to uh, sell the uh, Chinese hamburger to the customers. However, all the offline shops are closed and we stop eating operation. So where to, to sell the baozi? And then so um, the community e-commerce model become to emerge because some of people in the WeChat group saying that we want to have both but we cannot get that. Can you deliver to us? So in the WeChat such as 100 or 200 residents in the same building, they will form a WeChat a group like a WhatsApp group and then they will say that we want both and then so they want to uh, book uh, from the king of Bao and then so the king of bow will deliver to the building and then at the downstairs people can come downstairs to collect the uh, food by themselves so it can cut down the delivery cost and the platform commissions fee and then they utilize existing channels such as mate one and Oloma. so you can see the picture that uh, uh, we found uh, online this is on the left is the mate one on the right is Oloma, which means are you hungry and then it's similar as uh, UK ones, Deliveroo or Uber Eats. So it's very good. And then people really enjoy the very convenient delivery during the COVID-19 lockdown period of time. And then, so the win-win situation of the King of Ball is that they, they turn it in services to offline delivery. And then they expand the kitchen because uh, previously they have other uh, functions. Now they just uh, focus on the uh, and then it's a community based uh, delivery. So they adjust the whole backstage supply chain and process rescheduled and then redesigned and then de develop the community e-commerce 
uh, model, which is very convenient and very highly efficient. And then they develop new markets. And then so they meet demands from customers in the neighborhood, residential complex. It's a very interesting. You can see we have this, uh, these cases and then very useful. So overall, we come up with um, organizational resilience uh, three states. And then uh, based on our discussion of the three cases, one from English education, one from manufacturing, and the one from the food industry, we can see that the first stage is that we need to have crisis cognition. And this cognition, the worse the situation you found out, the better you can recover afterwards. So it's similar as when we are in a crisis, we, we, we need to know how uh, different it is like uh, compared with previously. So we need to have a sober um, awareness of the current uh, uh, situation and it is closely related to the value positioning of the firm and the ultimate multiple goals and the identities of the company. So for example, the, in the first case, as we mentioned, they said that all the pre-assumptions are all not in place now. We cannot rely on them. It's totally different when we, we need to start with a new, brand new piece of paper and start with our new model, this model. And then second is about proactive action. So once we are totally uh, clear on the same page, all the employees, all the management um, uh, level, we know that the, everything is different, then we need to make the appropriate decisions firmly, either short term or long term. Because some of the opportunities are very scarce and very valuable, we need to grasp this opportunity and plan ahead. And then supported by sufficient consideration and calculation of risks, costs, profits, and time span. Also, we need to control our um, temptation to get more and more profits. Like if you get something related to mask, you think that, oh, I can get very rich. However, there's some uh, traps in the industry sometimes as well. So need to be guaranteed about the full payment, and then to be guaranteed that we don't lose our focus. It's just one opportunity. We need to quickly come into the market and then quickly come out of the market because it's rather short-term based, not long-term based. And then the most important thing is the third stage, which is confidence recovery. We need to transfer from short-term to long-term in terms of decision made during crisis, because we, we cannot always rely on masks, we cannot always rely on offline uh, delivery, etc. We need to, to, to make sure our strategies can fit into future development and uh, future operation. And then how to get long-term um, benefit because of the COVID-19 and then we look at the market again and we double check the market and the competitor situation, how we can move forward, what are the new, we call new normal situation, uh, what are the strategies we need to adopt, what are the values we really uh, want to embrace and to put into high priority, ranking, etc. So confidence recovery is the third but it's very important in looking to the, to the future. So we look at the, um, the organization resilience just now through three uh, cases, and then now we are still collecting new cases, and then in UK, and then in, U, in, in China. And then I talk with the Nexus um, director, Martin Stone, and the last month, and then he said uh, in Nexus, we also have very good examples of companies who transform from cosmetic manufacturing to hand sanitizer uh, manufacturing. So it's very relevant to resilience uh, coping strategy. So very good cases just beside us and very good. Yeah. So welcome questions and then we can have discussion.
Oh, well, thank you very much, Linda. That's uh, that was really interesting, and um, I'll, I'll let um, people have a couple of minutes to to think about some questions. And if you could pop them in the chat, that would be useful. I mean, similarly, if uh, if people have got examples of uh, that either their own businesses or businesses that they they know of and how they have been able to sort of pivot, um, you know, I think that would be that would be very interesting for for the other participants here. So. Um, in the meantime, whilst uh, whilst people are thinking about questions, perhaps I can just ask you um, a, a little bit, Linda, about what what are the sort of generic things that you think um, organisations could take from some of the case studies that you've been looking at. What's the um, what are the what's the sort of the next step for them? Do you think in in terms of how they've been coping with things? Yeah, and the most important thing is that they can look back into their values and then get to know how that is related to their current situation. And then, so what are the obstacles they are facing? And then they, they look into whether there are some pre assumptions are not valid at all, and then how to deal with the different multiple identities. And then they can also look at what their competitors are doing, whether they, they want to be the um, first first mover or they, they want to be the follower in the market and what are the other competitors are doing and then whether they, he can learn from the, the competitors and to find out the best ways to deal with, um, I think there will be different uh, opportunities, different strategies like in the market and then he or she will, can see how their company can contribute to using their own strengths like a SWOT analysis, but it is based on the crisis situation. It's a huge transformation compared with previously. And to see that in the uh, crisis, what are their SWOT uh, uh, situation is and what are the opportunities they can find out. Um, it, it is very good to have a learning attitude and mindset to look at the whole uh, situation. Yeah. yeah, great. I mean, you've mentioned about these uh, these multiple different um, things that every organization has to be, you know, it's an employer, it's a competitor, it's, you know, all those different facets to it. Where should organizations be concentrating at the moment, do you think, on sort of the, the things that they're doing? Uh, yeah, so uh, we if we look at the um, um, our stakeholder perspective will have Im become employer, we become collaborator, we become suppliers. So I think the most important thing is to look at what the core competitive advantage of the company. So if they are competitive advantage is supply chain, and then they need to look at how they can ensure the win-win situation in of their partners in the supply chain. Um, so how they can uh, develop their strengths during the process and how to ensure they can uh, benefit, um, not get so much uh, decline because of the crisis and then how to protect the supply chain. So it's, it's basically it's, it's develop their own uh, core strategy uh, regarding to their competitive advantage. And sometimes during the COVID-19 or during the crisis, they might discover their potential, which previously was not their uh, competitive advantage. For example, the offline uh, education now moved to online education, like multimedia elements into the education uh, a providing process. So previously they might not discover they have this online education or online delivery, uh, online food providing uh, model, business model there, but they can they can develop and they can learn from the process and then they can have new uh, competitive advantage during the process. It's new capabilities building. I know it's very hard, but it's very important to know what are the strength of the current company, what is possible uh, to learn and then to develop the new capacity and then they, they might find a new identity. So that is very interesting that previously the company might not discover, but they have to discover if they open their eyes and to see what the market want, what the overall situation is and how difficult it is and what competitors are doing. They have to to move quickly and then they have to learn through the process and to discover their new identity, I think. Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. And I mean, it's getting that headspace at the moment, isn't it, to think about yeah. what those advantages might be. So um, we've, we've got a question in the chat here, which I think is, is relevant leading on from that in, in terms of how how can we take what we know about organisational resilience and, and help companies to think about training their employees to be resilient during these times? Yes, this this is a very uh, good question. Thank you. And uh, I think this is uh, related to the three levels of resilience. So we have individual level resilience, and we have a team level, and we can firm level. So this is very very important. If the organization can have a clear strategy uh, about how to deal with the uh, crisis, and then it can trickle down to the team and to the individual. And then for the if we can articulate the vision and the mission and then what we can do in the process, then people will not feel uncertain. So mostly, most of the time, uh, employees will feel very, very worried and uncertain about what is going to have, right? So I previously had a paper regarding how CEO rhetoric, CEO's presentation um, elements, their presentation words can convey to the employees about the confidence, about realistic future, about realistic uh, difficulties, about um, very um, good confidence to the employees and optimistic but very realistic estimation at the same time. So it is very important to, to have the to have the development of the uh, rhetoric of the organization leaders to say that, yes, we have these obstacles, but we have these directions, and then to provide them with the overall picture of the to the employees. And then employees need to be uh, supported by very good learning materials and uh, about like uh, teamwork, and then it's very coherent and uh, cohesive. Uh, teamwork and then people can develop their um, team spirit together and then to solve the problem together and then have innovative creative ideas uh, emerging from the process so uh, individuals are very important then they need to be motivated and empowered to get the best knowledge out of the uh, market. Previously, we, we talk about creativity, but at the time of, of the crisis, I think creativity at individual level is very important because sometimes we only need to rely on individuals, employees, to develop their um, sensing cap capabilities. They get to know what is very necessary on the front end, uh, in the in the market, what others are doing. So it's very important to have an empowering leadership style, and then to have the employees getting uh, individuals getting know what is the best practices according to their um, intuitive ideas or in according to their brainstorming. So from bottom up, it's very important for individuals to come up with creative ideas and with teamwork, and then uh, we have. Um, very good communication through the uh, optimistic but realistic rhetoric, and then to ensure we have a clear value system and a clear vision to guide the whole process. I think this is a very good question. I think it's, it's very, very important. Yeah. It's, it seems like one of the, the things that you're really advocating here is honesty in, in terms of, uh, you know, um, employers being honest about what their businesses can and cannot achieve during these times, but also sharing that with their employees and allowing them to, to sort of have their say in it as well. Yeah, yeah, it's very important for being uh, honest to, to people and then have smooth communication. At the same time, encourage uh, creativity uh, at the individual and team level. Yeah, it's very important. Yeah. Uh, and so, obviously, you you have a, a, a sort of a more of a unique uh, situation for for some of us in that you have these links into what's going on with some of the the, the organisations based in China, where they're a bit ahead, I suppose, of their um, you know 
uh, coping mechanisms uh, with this. So what do you think um, organisations in the UK could learn about in terms of organisational resilience from some of our um, sort of Chinese uh, counterparts? Yeah, I think it's a very, very good question. Nowadays, I'm talking together, I'm working together with Matt Davis and Rebecca and uh, also uh, Kerry and um, developing uh, the, how the small and medium sized organizations are dealing with crisis and what they are doing uh, in during this time. So we are about to kick off the project and we will have a webinar first and then we have interviews, uh, focus group discussions, and then we try to uh, capture what people are doing in UK. I, I know that in our management division, we have many very good uh, colleagues who are doing this uh, studies like uh, Joyti, um, uh, Gubano, and uh, Chi Wang, they, they all doing very good uh, studies related to COVID-19, uh, Yasmina, and so so I, I think if we ha have a future, we have a webinar, or we have, have a Zoom meeting to have forum, we can discuss all the different um, uh, perspective from a supply chain, from information system, etc. And Gary, uh, in our management division, he said that many journals now have a call for a paper about COVID-19. And so if anyone who has any questions or um, ideas regarding the COVID-19 related um, items or papers, ideas we can discuss with Gary, and then we can all uh, can discuss in our management division and in loops. And it's very important to look at how UK companies are dealing with. Because when I talk with Martin in uh, Nexus, he say he said he he already get one or two cases about how great our uh, in organizations in our incubator in Nexus got. Uh, through the process and they become resilient and successful to can can share with us about their experience. So I think a very good opportunities for us to to interview them, uh, to get close with them. And then our uh, management division, we have an advisory board and the board chair and the members are very keen to discuss with us about the developments in NHS, development in manufacturing, uh, in every uh, sector that we are interested in. And uh, I, I'm also glad to share with you, we have a collaboration with the RACCM. Uh, it's an association with a, a lot of companies around the world. The RACCM association is collaborating with our business school, our management division, and the law school, uh, focusing on business contracts, uh, development, etc. So we can look into that and then to see how their members in the association will do it. And the clusters in marketing division, they have a lot of uh, um, uh, colleagues who are doing very great job and the clusters already promoted that in Twitter and in LinkedIn. And then we have impact series that are organized by Caroline and you. We, we are promoting the best practices um, in UK. I think it's very great. I think uh, uh, loops and uh, many divisions can contribute in the process to get the best practices of our UK companies, um, large companies, small and medium sized companies, and also NHS and the nonprofit organizations, social entrepreneurs, and charity. So these are all very relevant. I, and, and I'm very happy to okay. listen to more stories. Yeah. Great. Um, well, I mean, that sounds like it's a good, um, you know, a sense of if people are listening and they want to get involved with some of these projects and, and research, then then do get in touch. Um, we've got a couple of questions in chat just to, to get through before uh, before we, we run out of time. Uh, so one of them is, um, how long do you think it's going to take for companies to, to go through this process, to develop their own strategies, to become sort of resilient and react to these situations? And if there are sort of different lengths of time, is there an advantage for companies yeah. that are able to do this more quickly? Yeah, thank you, uh, Kwan. I think it's a very good question. And I, I, some companies, because of the uh, COVID-19 crisis, they, they, they only get very limited time, like one week or two weeks to, to get everything settled down. Otherwise, they get huge lo loss because parents in the first 
case, the parents are starting to ask their money back. So if they do not shift their strategy, they cannot survive. So uh, the second, uh, second case is just uh, one week, they redesigned, they transformed the assembly line. So sometimes the strategy is, is like uh, having a war. So it's very important that uh, one minute you are ahead of time, one minute you are later. And then so it's very important, like one week or two weeks, you will get everything fixed. So, but but of, of course, we're looking to the institutional constraints. We'll look at what are the companies doing, uh, whether we have law uh, regulations um, in place. So we need to take some time to ensure everything is doing properly, it's on the right track. This is also very, very important. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess the answer is very quick then. A, a week is is almost nothing, isn't it? If you're talking yeah. about shifting a, a whole organisational's um, approach or, or sort of manufacturing various things. Um, so just to, just to follow up on, on some of the kind of employee comments that you made earlier, another question here. Um, is there a strong connection between employee resilience and leadership styles? So are we seeing some companies really excelling here? Yes, I, I can see that. Um, uh, Lee Jo proposed a very good question. And then, uh, yes, we, we see that leadership styles, if the leaders are very transformational, and then if they are uh, empowering or if they are very charismatic and then they can uh, boost the employees' resilience. I, I think it's a very good question. I, I, it is worthwhile to have some um, uh, empirical testing of the, of the idea. This is a very good question, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, presumably some of this links back to the comments you were making earlier about the, the mm. transparency within the organization and employees being able to see that there is there has been this pivot, but there is a clear direction that there is a, a very clear sort of, um, you know, uh, a way forward for them to come through the crisis, uh, presumably together as, as, as one organization. Yes, yes. Great. Um, so uh, what about some um, other kinds of organizations that haven't been able to, to necessarily uh, to pivot in, in quite this way? What, where's, what's happening there? Can, have you got examples where we've sort of seen the opposite of organizational resilience and, and things falling apart? Are there, are there lessons to be learned there? Yes. Yeah, sometimes if we look at the uh, organizational resilience, usually uh, or uh, in the case studies, we usually look at those successful companies as well as the uh, companies that are failing in the process. I think it's very uh, important that we, when we interview some companies, they said that um, although they got some um, good um, output during the COVID-19, but they really doubt whether they can sustain after the COVID-19. And then some like uh, the trading, uh, the companies like uh, foreign trading, they uh, really suffer a lot in the in the process. I think it's related to the overall uh, process. And then uh, if we go to the interviews, we'll see some of the companies, they no longer exist <laughs> because of the COVID-19 and the some of the companies just uh, stop operation. So it is, uh, um, and, and no, so, some of the uh, training companies like uh, are stopping, uh, are stopped, uh, they already cannot operate because of the COVID-19. So it's very tough uh, experience uh, nowadays. We, we don't know how UK companies can, uh, can survive. Sometimes uh, some of the companies, they, they are facing very, very uh, serious um, challenges. I think this is also worthwhile to take a look of that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it usually it's very important if we look at both successful and failure companies and then to look into um, the different um, components and different uh, strategies. However, when we do research, it's very hard to find some um, some failure companies because they they some of them they are reluctant to share and some of them they just uh, disappear 
And then that is very difficult situation for our researchers as well. But we can try to, to find some, but it's very, very hard. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine it's probably the last thing that they want to, yeah. to necessarily uh, talk about, but um, but perhaps it's, there are lessons to be learned. So um, another question, which I think is um, very relevant, given that uh, we feel like maybe we've passed the first peak of the crisis, but um, there, there are lots of worries about um you know a second wave coming um in in the uk and that perhaps there is already something going on in beijing uh, around that as well so how can organizations uh, survive consecutive crises um i mean i think it's a good uh, question here from sabrina who said if they've got previous experience of dealing with this and sort of pivoting and getting things moving really quickly, does that actually give them sort of an advantage or, or are they are they just going to get tired? Is this just going to be something that's going to use all their resources to, to sort of breaking point, do you think, the threat of a, a second wave? Yes, I, I think that the uh, two points. The first is that people are very um clear that the for survival purpose the company need to do their best and then even for the consequent uh consequent um crisis when people face and then second wave we still need to fight against that but at the same time uh according to the um experts from the psychology perspective they said that even for the top managers re recently they feel very exhausted so the managers uh psychological well-being we need to pay attention to as, as well so it's not to say that um, we just look at organization as very uh, not human beings but they are consistent of human beings especially for the uh, stress uh, stress level for every level is very high and the, during the COVID-19 if we look back we'll see how much anxiety worries and concerns people are suffering and then um, so also um, same as the frontline um, people and then the managers, they also suffer a lot. So well-being is a very good topic that we can focus on Do the research. And then currently some of the research are doing like NHS, people's well-being, and some are looking at employees. But we also need to look at managers, uh, their well-being, whether they feel very tired, they really don't want to uh, carry on and because of so much uh, challenges there. So is this a very good question? I think we need to pay attention to the well-being as well, because my areas, organization behavior and individual uh, resilience or individual uh, attitudes and behaviors, creativity, uh, performance, attitudes, uh, motivation. So for me, when, when I talk about organizational resilience, I always want to take a look of the managers, CEOs, um, communication, leadership, and individual and team level uh, motivation and well-being. So well-being is a kind of topic that is suitable for every level. So for CEOs, they might feel very worried and they, they might uh, um, commit suicide sometime, you know, <laughs> if they are very, very tired, they, if they also, they, they, they have high debt uh, on their shoulder. So that is terrible. So we, we need to pay attention to, to that part, uh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that's a, an excellent uh, point that you made. That organisations are are made up of individuals, and we have to we have to look after them a, a, as much as anything else. Um, a, a question here then around sort of you know where are the opportunities in this? So uh, where where we do have companies that are seeing perhaps their competitors not uh, pivoting as quickly or not taking advantage is this is this the time for companies to be merging with their competitors to to be building up sort of you know larger perhaps more resilient organizations um, at this time uh, I think yes yeah, some of the cases I think it is and so it is also a very good opportunity for the government to to look into restructure the uh, the current industries, uh, for example. So, for example, uh, Beijing, the property price is declining, is decreasing, and constantly. So, for um, real estate companies, previously they are developing very, very fast. They get a lot of um, revenue, uh, profits after that. However, because of COVID-19, their cash flow chain almost broke. 
accordingly, and then they some of the small ones they cannot they cannot uh, sustain, so they they have to um, to to merge with other big ones or be merged by the other ones, and the more uh, better operationalized in terms of the cash flow and the financial situation. So I, I got to know that some already is doing this kind of uh, merging. And previously, before the COVID-19, I know uh, Lianjia, which is a very big uh, real estate trading company, brokery trading company, they, they, they already merged a lot of uh, small and medium-sized branches of other brands. They, they come up with a platform, a similar as Taobao, eBay. It's, it's kind of real estate trading platform online, and which is very, it's, it's very good. Uh, although they have some um, obstacles and conflicts inside in terms of the merging process, but they really benefit a lot. And then this might be the direction for the industry to have the best one to emerge and then to merge and then for the small ones if they do not cannot survive due to the financial crisis they might um, merge with others or find other investors and uh, like the english company and then they can they can develop afterwards so i think it's a good opportunity for the best practiced organizations to merge with uh, not so well companies if they can they can do so, I think it's a low price nowadays. Yeah. Great, yeah, so um, um, Gary's commented um, in, in the chat window there that we, we are now all in a position where we're looking towards confidence recovery, where we're <laughs> moving from some of these short term, uh, very chaotic things that are going on to sort of longer term things that we can do to, to maximize the opportunities. Um, so the time has flashed by and in a second, Linda, I'm just gonna give you the opportunity to um, provide us with some summary thoughts before we say a, a big thank you and goodbye um, but whilst you're um, kind of composing that I just wanted to let everyone know who is on the call if you have um, joined us because you registered through Eventbrite you will be sent a copy of the slides that Linda has been using today um, and there will be a recording of this presentation available through the LUBS uh, sort of the Leeds University Business school uh, website uh, within the next few days uh, we do actually have um, webinars planned for every Tuesday and Thursday towards the to, to the back end of, of July there's a full catalogue of things that we're discussing all re re related to sort of businesses and their experiences um, with uh, with COVID so Linda can I just um, invite you in the last couple of minutes of, of today's session to to sort of give us leave with some parting thoughts uh, of things that you you would want us to, to take away from today yeah I, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to discuss with uh, all of you regarding my uh, research I really look forward to have future uh, collaborations with uh, colleagues and here and then for example uh, regarding organizational resilience, we can discuss from different perspectives and then we can have the leadership, marketing, strategy and uh, organization theory, all the principles to develop together. So I think it's very important that we can work together and then we can look at the interesting topics together. And thank you so much to come to today's uh, webinar. I feel very happy and then to share this with, with you. Thank you. Oh no, well that's fantastic. I think also um, a huge uh, thank you from us as well. Um, you know, that's been an absolutely fascinating talk and I know there's an awful lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to kind of condense all of this research down to some very, very key takeaways um, uh, and, and excellently presented. And thank you so much for us answering such a wide range of, of questions. Um, Th thanks ever so much um, and uh, you can see there is a thanks pouring in as well from our um, participants here and uh, my thanks to all of you for providing interesting questions and a very engaging engaging session um, for those of you who've not used 
collaborate before you you now need to see yourselves out uh, there is a hamburger menu up on the top left um, which if you click that